There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Twisted Philly. I'm your host, Dina Marie. It feels so good to be back on the mic talking with everyone. I've had a few hectic weeks, and when I get on the mic and think of all of you listening, it's awesome. Thank you so much to the folks who came out for the live show. That was one of the coolest experiences of my entire life. I've been in situations where I have to present in front of other people. I do public speaking for my day job and at events for leaders. I have a theater background, so I've been on stage, but this was really entirely different. In theater, when you're acting, you're someone else. And when I speak professionally, I'm focused on leadership principles and business practices. Doing a live show for Twisted Philly was one of the most vulnerable experiences of my life. Crying in front of other people, many of whom were strangers to me, but trusting that since they listen to the show, they'll be okay with me just being me. Well, that's scary. It's what I do each week on the podcast, and doing it face-to-face, I wanted folks to enjoy it just as much as they do when they listen at home. I'm so grateful to the Philly Podcast Society for what was a really incredible night. Before we get into today's story, I have so much to catch up on. For the past six weeks, I've been involved in another podcast project. Margot D., my dear friend who co-hosts one of my favorite shows, Book vs. Movie, invited me to join her each week recapping the Spike TV miniseries The Mist, based on the novella by Stephen King. If you're a Stephen King fan or if you're watching the series, I would love for you to check out our Mist recaps and everything else on Book vs. Movie. I really enjoy listening to Margot D. and her co-host Margot P. talk about books that have been adapted into movies. Their latest episode was about Ms. Peregrine's Home for Unusual Children, and it's a terrific discussion comparing the book and the film. I have so many what-ups for listeners, I am so behind, and if I do them all in this one episode, it will be two hours long, so I'm going to do a few now and a few at the end of the episode, and then probably over the course of the next three episodes, I should be caught up. So what up to Betty33, Rainbow Ramona, Ladybug Cutie, Roxy Zeve, Five Wilhelminas, Pearly Girl, Tony the Mechanic, Lacey U28, Sriracha, You Me and the Monkeys, Ty PH, Mimi, Cro Magnum 66, and Jennifer from Lima. Thank you so much. I know it's a pain in the ass to figure out how to leave reviews on iTunes, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to share such kind words about the show. I'll mention a few more folks in another round of What Ups at the end of the episode. This episode is called As You Wish because it was listener requested. So I had this idea last week for speed podcasting. Listeners pick a topic and I'll do an episode about it, hopefully within just a few days. Well, then a massive project came up at work, so my time at night was taken away from podcasting to building executive presentations, and here we are a week later, releasing the listener-requested topic, Laurel Hill Cemetery. Three Mile Island ran a very close second, so I'll be releasing an episode about the near-nuclear disaster we experienced in Pennsylvania in a few weeks. Between the late 1700s and the early 1900s, there were 14 potter's fields in the city of Philadelphia. Tragically, many of these locations, especially the mass burial sites, were primarily used for African Americans living in Philadelphia. Even those who fled to Philly to escape slavery weren't spared a communal burial when they didn't have the means for a private resting place. There was a potter's field in Washington Square uncovered in 1950. There was one at 18th and Race near Logan Square in the early 1800s. In 2009, archaeologists found close to 60 intact burials across from St. Peter and Paul's Basilica. The bodies weren't exhumed. They were preserved in place, and they still rest there today. There was another one at 9th and Lombard along the Schuylkill River north of Market Street. There's the Cherry Hill Burial Ground on Fairmount between 19th and 20th. Another potter's field at 20th and Parish that the city thought was removed in 1890. But again, in 2009, seven bodies from the mid-1800s were found in the basement in the 800 block of 20th Street, left over from that potter's field that operated between 1818 and 1860. And I could keep going. 
There were so many more than just the ones I mentioned here, and I share this with you to give you an idea of how many burial sites were in the city of Philadelphia during the 1800s. And these were only the potter's fields. Besides the potter's field, some of the earliest burial grounds in Philadelphia were Quaker cemeteries, many dating back to the 1690s. And calling them Quaker wasn't exactly true. They were certainly established by the Quakers, but they weren't exclusive to Quaker members because the Quakers would open their churches and their cemeteries to other members of the community. Between common graves and potter's field, Quaker cemeteries, plus new church cemeteries popping up all over the city of Philadelphia, we were basically a maze of burial grounds. And still, it wasn't enough. In the early 1800s, there were about 40,000 people living in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. And within 50 years, the population more than tripled. Before the turn of the century, there were over 1 million people in Philadelphia. The city struggled to keep up with the population growth throughout the 1800s, and more people meant more deaths. Our cemeteries were overflowing to the point when families wanted to visit their loved ones at their final resting places, even in a churchyard cemetery, you weren't guaranteed to find their grave. That's exactly what happened to a man named John J. Smith. He was a Quaker living in Philadelphia in the early 1800s. Smith was actually born in New Jersey in 1778, and by 1829, he worked as a librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia. By 1935, he'd buried one child and remarked in his diary how difficult it was to find her grave. What might have contributed to this difficulty finding his daughter is that Quaker cemeteries did not allow grave markers until the late 1800s. The Quakers believed markers were a sign of excess, and it contradicted their commitment to plainness. In some cases, even after the Quakers lifted the restriction on grave markers, some traditional members would remove markers and headstones even into the early 20th century. In 1835, when John J. Smith went searching for his daughter's grave in the Friends Cemetery on Cherry Street, it would have been very difficult to find without a marker. Plus, the increased number of burials occurring in these cemeteries meant even if he knew, perhaps under which tree, his daughter were buried, he could no longer be certain there weren't other people buried practically on top of her. All of this was unacceptable to Smith and to other people in Philadelphia. He wrote in his diary, The city of Philadelphia has been increasing so rapidly of late years that the living population has multiplied beyond the means of accommodation for the dead. On recently visiting Friends Graveyard in Cherry Street, I found it impossible to designate the resting place of a darling daughter. Determined me to endeavor to procure for the citizens a suitable, neat, and orderly location for a rural cemetery. Rather than simply complain about these circumstances, John J. Smith decided it was time to do something about it. He and his partners knew they wanted something different, something that would stand not only as a more spacious resting place for Philadelphia's deceased, but a place outside the city, one that would evoke peace, serenity, and a place to enjoy the natural surroundings away from Philadelphia's crowded streets. This cemetery would also be non-denominational, following the philosophy of Quaker burial grounds where the space was open to others. And in 1836, a solution presented itself, the grounds of an estate along the Schuylkill River called Laurel Hill. The land at Laurel Hill Estate provided beautiful hilltop views of the river, and in its early days, families even traveled to Laurel Hill Cemetery by steamboat. The cemetery was designed by Scottish architect John Notman, who immigrated to Philadelphia just a few years earlier in 1831. Notman studied architecture at the Royal Academy of Scotland, and he was considered one of the most innovative architects in America during the late 19th century. His vision for Laurel Hill Cemetery was to use the hills as an amphitheater so that at almost every level of the cemetery, you could see views of the Schuylkill River. And as you visit today, an amphitheater is the best description of what it feels like to drive around Laurel Hill. At the time it was built in 1836, it was one of only two rural cemeteries in the entire country. The cemetery sits on 78 acres, and it wasn't that big when it started. There are two main vehicle entrances. One is off the 3800 block of Ridge Avenue, and the other is off Kelly Drive near Huntington Avenue. 
That's usually the way I go in when I visit. And when you come in off Kelly Drive, one of the first pieces of architecture you'll notice are these incredible above-ground mausoleums. If you've ever seen the cemeteries in New Orleans, like Lafayette Number 1 and 2, you will instantly find familiarity in the mausoleums in Laurel Hill. There are so many of them. It's like row after row of, I don't know, tiny houses. Except instead of providing shelter for folks looking to downsize, these structures provide the ultimate in downsizing because basically you're downsized forever. The roots in Laurel Hill wind in tight upward circles, and sometimes it might feel like there isn't enough room for your car to make the turn, but there always is. And the cemetery has these little turnabouts making it easier than you would expect to navigate these high winding hills. On either side of the roads in Laurel Hill, there are beautiful monuments and tombstones that seem to go on for miles. So many of the markers are incredible obelisks that are close to 200 years old, and they're taller than anything I've ever seen in any other cemeteries. There's room to park, and that's what I do when I visit Laurel Hill. I park, I grab my camera, and I start walking. I'll walk for close to an hour just gazing at old tombstones and statuary. So many areas of Laurel Hill look out over the Schuylkill River, and the views are magnificent. John J. Smith and the men who helped fund Laurel Hill Cemetery almost 200 years ago knew what they were doing. The cemetery is especially lovely in spring when the flowering trees are in bloom. The dogwood trees are just gorgeous. One of the best views, I think, and you can actually see a picture of this on the website, is in South Laurel Hill overlooking the receiving vault. It looks like a mini coliseum, and the cemetery stretches on forever with beautiful sculptures and obelisks. And I realize some of you hearing me describe a cemetery as beautiful may think that sounds strange or even macabre, yet that's what it is. It's tranquil and peaceful, and it's really a journey in art history. Laurel Hill is one of my favorite places in Philadelphia to photograph or sit on a hill and read in the shade. No, I don't ever feel scared there or as if I'm being watched. If you go to Laurel Hill and you're not on a tour, especially if it's your first visit, go online and download a map because it's a circuitous place and you could easily get turned around and wind up in the north section of the cemetery when you intended to go to the south. It's huge. Doing a tour of Laurel Hill, though, is fabulous, even if you've already visited the cemetery, because you will learn so much about the history, the architecture, and some very famous residents. I'll share a few with you now just to whet your appetite. A Philadelphia celebrity who was buried not that long ago in Laurel Hill Cemetery was Harry Callis. Harry was buried there in 2009, and he was the unmistakable voice of the Philadelphia Phillies for 38 years, right up until he passed away. From the cradle of liberty, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, do we have closure? No. No, the heinous acts of terrorism last Tuesday will be with us for as long as we all shall live. We have earned a greater respect and love for the men and women of our fire departments, our police departments, our emergency rescue squads. We are all Americans and we are proud to be Americans. And we must never resort to the thinking that created Tuesday's acts of terrorism. They were born of hatred. We as individuals, we as a nation, must never hate. More than ever before, we must stand together and live by his words, that above all else, love one another, love thy brother. Yes, baseball will go on. It won't be the same. It'll be a long time before it's the same. But sports has always been a diversion from our everyday problems, and in this case, from a national tragedy. Our thoughts and prayers in our hearts go out to the families and to the friends of the victims of the tragedy of September 11, 2001. His tombstone is so different than so many in Laurel Hill because it has a giant microphone on top, which is so fitting for Harry. And there are two seats at his grave from the old veteran stadium where we used to watch our Phillies play. General George Gordon Meade is also buried there. If you've been listening to Twisted Philly since the early days, you heard me talk about General Meade in Episode 5, Haunted Hill, when I told the story of the Balleroy Mansion, which was owned by his great-grandson, George Gordon Meade Easby. 
General Meade was famous for winning the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 against General Robert E. Lee, and there are other soldiers and generals buried there as well. Many of the statues at Laurel Hill were created by Alexander Milne Calder. I'm not going to tell you who that is. You should know who that is if you listened to one episode in particular. Because, Twisters, it's important to me that you learn a little history on this podcast. Maybe not every episode, but damn near as often as possible. I'll tell you what. The first person who tweets me the episode title where I talked about Alexander Milne Calder wins a Twisted Philly t-shirt. If you're not following me on Twitter, you can find me at Twisted underscore Philly. I also want to tell you about some of the amazing events and activities at Laurel Hill. But before I do that, I'm going to take a quick break to share some sponsor info and tell you about a few podcasts that I really enjoy. Now, I know some listeners are inclined to skip this part. I get it. Before I launched my own show, I am ashamed to admit, I was inclined to skip these type of breaks too. And shame on me, because listening about sponsors, patronizing those sponsors, and tuning into other indie podcasts really helps all of us be successful and keep delivering great content to all of you. I'm so excited to talk to you again about Maisie and Lee Small Batch Maple Syrup. I know a few of you tried Maisie and Lee for yourselves after I introduced them on Twisted Philly. Maisie and Lee is an independent suburban Philly business making craft maple syrup in bourbon and rye whiskey barrels. Yeah, it tastes even better than it sounds. It's real maple syrup from Pennsylvania trees aged in oak barrels right outside of Philly in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania at the Bluebird Distillery. My personal favorites are the bourbon syrup and the wheat whiskey syrup. I use the bourbon maple syrup in a maple walnut pie I make around the holidays, and it's incredible. Some listeners have gone crazy over the cocoa-infused syrup, pouring it over yogurt and ice cream. Of course, you can use Maisie and Lee on old-fashioned pancakes, and it's delicious. Plus, these flavors open up other culinary opportunities you would never consider with regular old grocery store syrup. You can order Maisie and Lee online through their Etsy shop. I'll put a link on my Facebook and Twitter pages. And if you're local, you can buy it at the Bluebird Distillery in Phoenixville or at Bluebird's pop-up shop in Liberty Place in Philadelphia. Maisie and Lee will also be at a few festivals in the coming months. They'll be at the Phoenixville Punk Rock Flea Market, which is a fantastic event. That's on August 28th. And at the Phoenixville Food Festival on October 1st. Murder Road Trip is a true crime podcast where I, your host Haley, discuss murder cases in my car, aka the Mobile Beats Lab. Join me and my partner in crime, H.H. Gnomes, on the road. There will be games, mixtapes, and snacks as I make the research journey to murder scenes around the world. Make sure to check your back seat, and I'll see you at the next rest stop. Twisters, I want to take a minute and tell you about an incredible event in development called Pottern Love. Pottern Love is a podcast festival created for listeners by listeners, and it's August 10th, 11th, and 12th in 2018 in New Orleans, Louisiana. For two and a half days, listeners have the opportunity to interact with some of their favorite hosts at live shows, panel discussions, Q&As, podcast booths, even an awards ceremony where you choose your favorite podcast episodes. Hosts from all types of podcasts will be participating, including comedy, pop culture, history, true crime, health and wellness, paranormal, audio dramas, movie and entertainment, and so many more. You can find out more about the event and order tickets on their Indiegogo campaign. Just search on Potter and Love, or you can find the link on the Twisted Philly Facebook page. You can also follow them on Twitter and Facebook at Potter and Love, P-O-D-E-R-N-L-O-V-E. That's all one word. Right now, tickets are discounted through Indiegogo, so it's your chance to get a ticket before they sell out at a reduced price. For their first event, Potter and Love is only offering 700 tickets, and I know you won't want to miss this convention. I'll Be There plus Generation Y, History Goes Bump, The Unwritable Rant, True Crime Fan Club, Between Us Girls, and so many more. Potter and Love has over 15 podcasts already lined up, and they'll be announcing more in the next few weeks. This is an event I know you won't want to miss, and I'll be hosting something creepy for listeners while we're in New Orleans. I can't wait for Potter and Love, and I really hope I'll see you there. As added encouragement, 
The first five Twisted Philly listeners who get their tickets through Indiegogo and send me a screenshot of their confirmation will get a Twisted Philly prize pack with a t-shirt, mug, and some other fun little swag. Laurel Hill Cemetery may be the sort of place you'd expect to attend events in the fall, especially around Halloween. And for sure, they've got great activities in season. But it's also a terrific place to visit throughout the year. The cemetery is open six days a week, Monday through Friday from 8 till 4.30, and on Saturday from 9.30 till 4.30. It's a non-profit organization, and donations are very much appreciated, so don't be cheap. On Friday, August 18th, Laurel Hill is featuring Cinema in the Cemetery. This is part of their annual summer movie series. Yes, movies outdoors in a cemetery. I cannot think of anything better than watching a classic horror film among beautiful mausoleums and tombstones. This Friday, the film is the original House on Haunted Hill from 1959, starring the incomparable Vincent Price. <laughs> I'm Vincent Price, and you're invited to my party in the house on Haunted Hill, where so far the ghosts have murdered only seven people. So won't you come and make it eight? You'll see human heads without bodies, mysterious pools of blood dripping from the ceiling. The walls move slowly in against you. Don't try to escape, you can't. The ghosts are waiting, so won't you join me in the house on Haunted Hill? Hooray, or you'll be late for your own funeral. The movie starts at 9 p.m., but you definitely want to get there early and scout out a good spot for your blanket or your beach chairs. You can bring a picnic basket. Tickets are $10, and you can get them online on Laurel Hill's website. And you have to enter for check-in at the Ridge Avenue entrance. I will be missing this event because I'll be in Boston with my friend Mike Brown from the Pleasing Terrors podcast. We'll be attending a live show of both Nighttime Podcast and Crawl Space Podcast. But if I wasn't out of town, I definitely would be at Laurel Hill this Friday night. As it turns out, I won't be able to make the September cinema in the cemetery either, which is on Friday, September 8th. And that's the 1972 cult dark comedy Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. And it's hosted by special guest Rodney Anonymous from The Dead Milkmen. Oh my God, I freaking love them. And there's very little that would make me miss Laurel Hill's Cinema in the Cemetery with Rodney, except for seeing it on opening night with my dear friend, the beautiful Margot D of Book vs. Movie Podcast. We're going to watch the movie, then go back to her house and immediately record an episode for her show. Wednesday, August 23rd is the Laurel Hill Cemetery book launch party from 6 to 8 p.m. This event is free to the public. It's also at the Cemetery Gatehouse on Ridge Avenue, and there will be wine and cheese. They'll also have book signings by the authors Carol Yaster and Rachel Wolgamuth. Saturday, September 23rd, Atlas Obscura joins Laurel Hill for an event called Into the Veil, an event that their website describes as an immersive evening exploring the liminal world that exists between the land of the living and the realm of the dead. An evening of hidden art, music, cocktails, and entertainment will await under the cover of night as you choose your own path of discovery through the cemetery's enchanting hallowed grounds. They are encouraging cocktail attire with sensible footwear. That's an interesting look. Okay, that's an event that I can make. Tickets are available again on their website. This event is $50 for non-members, $45 for members. It's from 8 p.m. till midnight. Please tell me some of you will come out for that. There's so much more on their website. There's something fabulous and educational happening almost every week at Laurel Hill Cemetery. You just have to check online and then check your schedule. Laurel Hill Cemetery also offers private paranormal investigations. You can book a ghost hunting tour joined by Free Spirit Paranormal Investigators. Now, these folks will take you through some of the cemetery's most notoriously haunted spots. There's a lot of information on Laurel Hill's website you have to review if you want to book a group tour like this one. So check out their private ghost hunting guide online to make sure this is something you want to do. 
And if you decide you're interested in booking a ghost tour, email laurelhill at eas at thelaurelhillcemetery.org for more information. Now that's got me thinking about booking a ghost hunting tour for Twisted Philly listeners this fall. No promises, but I'm definitely going to look into it. Laurel Hill Cemetery is listed on so many websites as one of the most haunted places in Philadelphia. And while I'm sure it has its fair share of hauntings, I really didn't find too many mentions of an actual haunting or experiences visitors have had there. I've personally never had an experience with the paranormal at Laurel Hill, but then again, I've never done a ghost hunt there. There are a few videos on YouTube of investigators doing EVP readings, and no offense to the folks in the video, I wasn't convinced. Probably because at one point they go to Harry Callis's grave and ask him if he sees any penance in our future. Seriously, that was kind of douchey. If you're taking a trip out to Laurel Hill, let me know, because I'd love to join you if time permits. And if you're in the Boston area next weekend, on Saturday, August 19th, myself, Allison Horrocks from the Strange and Unusual podcast and Mike Brown from the Pleasing Terrors podcast are hosting a meetup in Salem. We'll be at Tavern on the Green at the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem, Massachusetts on Saturday night from 6.30 to 8. I hope you'll come out, share a drink with us, share some conversation. We'd love to meet you. Before I go, I'm going to share a few more what-ups for listeners who left five-star reviews for Twisted Philly. Celesco, Philly Fan WC, Ashley Rabbit Wright, all American Man. I love these names. My iTunes name is stupid and basic. The Storm Rider, Chemical Emma, and Penny was taken. Thank you all so very much. That's it from me for today. Ciao for now, Twisters.